Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good afternoon, United States. Good evening across the uh, ocean. Um, I am Alexander Mikabiridze, uh, Professor of History and Ruth Noel, uh, Herring Endowed Chair um, at the Louisiana State University in Shreveport. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today for the conclusion of the Masana Society Symposium hosted by the James Smith Noel Collection of Louisiana State University. I want to thank uh, a number of individuals. Um, first, uh, Chancellor Larry Clark of LSUS and my dear colleagues at the Department of History and Social Sciences for their uh, enormous support. I also want to extend my deep gratitude to the board of the Noel Foundation that manages the James Smith Noel Collection, one of the largest private collections of antiquarian books in the world. Uh, it is a life's work of a remarkable man, James Smith Noel, who loved books like very few people that I know of. And his uh, collection uh, houses close to quarter million uh, books, prints, maps, with a particular focus on the 18th century and uh, the revolutionary era. So as a uh, curator uh, of this collection, I want to encourage graduate students independent researchers, scholars to come visit Shreveport and see the Noel Collection and most crucially to use it in their own research. The Noel Collection offers fellowships in the amount of $2,000 to assist scholars interested in using uh, its resources and you can find more details in the, uh, on the website that I'll share um, as, as we go along in, in the chat room. Let me now uh, put, uh, put on my yet another hat. <laughs> I also have the privilege of serving on the board of the Masana Society, which aims to promote the academic scholarship of revolutionary era by organizing symposiums like this. But it also aspires on mentoring uh, the new generation of historians, on, on helping the graduate students you know, researching the Napoleonic and revolutionary uh, era. And uh, in that sense, um, the Masana Society um, currently, uh, currently provides research grants uh, to graduate students in the amount of up to $2,000 per person. Uh, and these students can use it to travel to conferences, to access archives, uh, essentially to use it to facilitate their research. Uh, and graduate students don't have to be members of the Masana Society to apply. Uh, and you will again find more details at the link that I'll post in the, in the chat. This year marks the uh, end of two decades uh, of Napoleonic bicentennials. The symposium was organized to mark this occasion. Over the last four days, we have listened uh, to dozens of insightful presentations delivered by esteemed um, group of historians, independent researchers, and graduate students. Today, we conclude the symposium with a keynote address by Professor Charles Astale. Let me bring him up. Dr. Esdale is one of Britain's foremost Napoleonic historians. He's professor of uh, emeritus of history at uh, University of Liverpool and author of numerous books on Napoleonic wars, including such classic works as the French Wars, 1792 to 1815, the Wars of Napoleon, Napoleon Wars and International History. His name is particularly associated with his remarkable work on the, war, on the wars in Spain and Portugal, on which he has written ex, uh, extensively and has authored several trail, trailblazing uh, books, including Women in the Peninsula War, The Spanish Army in the Peninsula War, uh, Spain in the Liberal Age, and of course, probably most famous of his works, The Peninsula War and New History, uh, the, in my mind, the best one volume account of this entire conflict. He was instrumental in challenging the longstanding views on the Spanish guerrillas, which he had, discu uh, which he had discussed in such books as Fighting Napoleon, the guerrillas, bandits and adventurers in Spain, or in another book such as Popular Resistance in the French Wars, Patriots, Partisans and Land Pilots. Now, Charles and I, um, collaborated in the, over the last few months on, on a new podcast, um, the Polyonic podcast, uh, hosted by our good friend Alex Stevenson, who recently observed that while I, uh, I'm not Napoleon's biggest enemy, Charles is certainly not Napoleon's biggest fan. Yeah, I like that 
uh, formula that Alex used, uh, so I decided to borrow it for the day. Today, Charles promises to share his thoughts about Napoleon in a talk entitled, Napoleon Rules OK? Some thoughts on recent biography. Dr. Estel. Hello, good evening, everybody. Um, first of all, Alex, thank you very much for that uh, very kind, indeed, overly kind introduction. At least I know I've got one friend out there. Um, OK, this paper is prompted by two issues, really. First of all, the appearance over the last 10 years or so of a whole series of biographies of Napoleon, um, some of which are, are very favorable to him, indeed, extremely favorable to him. And secondly, if you'll forgive the egotism, I wanted to kind of explain my position as a historian, because I think that there's a degree of, of misunderstanding out there. Um, I'll come on to that in a minute. Let me begin, though, uh, with a story about Adam Zamoyski. Um, I've got to include this story because Jackie Ryder would never forgive me otherwise. I was at a conference um, and Adam was speaking on his book on Napoleon. And at the end, I said, Mr. Zamoyski, why is Napoleon like a squirrel? You will forgive me, I was somewhat annoyed with the good gentleman. The answer to that, and Mr. Zawoyski didn't know, is because he is a high-flying rat with great PR. In other words, we are talking about somebody who has a tremendous legend attached to him. And this immediately takes us into the, uh, into the heart of my paper. Let me quote my good friend, Michael Brewers here. Um, and indeed, the author of one of these biographies, although this comes from an earlier book. Mike says, the Napoleonic legend is like a particularly persistent garden weed. The more you cut it back, the more it leaps up. Now, to the extent that the works uh, concerned are favorable to the emperor, they all fall back on a number of standard arguments. We hear about Napoleon's reforms. We hear about Napoleon's military victories. We hear about Napoleon's personal dynamism. We hear about the simple fact of Napoleon's rise to power from rats to riches or thereabouts. Yet each and every one of these points, uh, every one of them very questionable. While they are all either directly linked with Napoleonic legend, or at the very least, very much, how Napoleon would like to be seen. I think it is in fact very difficult to take a favorable view of Napoleon without taking his story and or legend at face value. Now this brings me to my position as a historian. I've been accused um, uh, of pursuing a vendetta against Napoleon, even of trying to destroy Napoleon. Now, it's certainly the case that I'm very critical of Napoleon, but to put it like that is to miss the point. How do I see Napoleon? Well, at base, I essentially see Napoleon as nothing more than a warlord and an adventurer. Oh yes, true, a warlord and an adventurer with, an, with immense talents, but nonetheless, a warlord and an adventurer. 
why then does he produce such a strong reaction in me? As indeed he does. From Alexander the Great to Saddam Hussein, or God help us, Vladimir Putin, history is littered with warlords and adventurers. But I don't hate them. Rather, I am indifferent to them. The difference, of course, is that they don't come um, accompanied by, uh, if you like, a heavenly chorus. Pushing the idea that they were variously men of genius, universal benefactors, and symbols of truth, justice, and progress. When I, when I uh, was writing this, um, at that point, I must admit um, that the, the concluding scene of the, of the first of the Superman movies that came out in the 1980s or 1990s came to mind. And Superman is there saying, yes, I'll fight for truth justice and the American way of life. Something which is quite opposite really, because of course, um, in the United States, there is a strong constituency which admires Napoleon, because I think, um, well, partly it may be because he, he's against Britain, but apart from that, because he is the classic example, if you want, of the little man made good. He is the American dream realized in Europe. So to return to my own position, what am I at war with? Who am I at war with? I am at war with not Napoleon the man, but the Napoleonic legend. And by extension, I suppose, those who continue to perpetrate it. Now, if you think about the task of the historian, um, I think you would agree with me that whatever one is looking at, there has to be a touch of iconoclasm. You have to be willing to ask questions you have to be willing to challenge. You have to be willing to refuse to take things at face value. And I honestly believe that it is the task of any historian to challenge legends of all sorts. In the same way, uh, I've done my best to, to challenge many of the fundamental legends of, of uh, Spain's war against Napoleon. Uh, you know, I've made myself very unpopular in certain quarters in Spain by saying things which are simply unpopular. Like, for example, the guerrilla war is a complete and total myth. You have to be ready to say such things. It is the duty of any historian. And so if I look at Napoleon, I must, in a sense, be critical. But I think that, that with Napoleon, there is very good reason to be critical. I'm sorry, excuse me. Now, so far, so good. What I intend to do in the rest of this paper is to take a look at a series of points that almost invariably figure in, to a greater or lesser extent, in positive views of Napoleon. And I've listed these, if you'll forgive me, under achievements on the one hand and excuses on the other. 
let's look at Napoleon's achievements. Well, first of all, we have the simple fact of his rise to power. Now, this certainly testifies to his talent, to his political acuity, to his political flexibility, to his opportunism. Yet it was just as much down to luck. Napoleon did get lucky. And at the same time, it's also worth pointing out that just maybe it's not quite so extraordinary. People say, and it's impossible to prove either way, that Napoleon would never have made it under the Ancien Regime? Well, perhaps not, we, we don't know. What we do know is that we can come up with a whole series of examples from the Ancien Regime it, in, in, at the close of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, where people who were outsiders, people who were nobodies, made it right to the top. Baron Acton in Naples, wasn't a baron to start with. Tugut, the Austrian chancellor, he was a foundling. Manuel de Godoy, the uh, Sp Spanish uh, prime minister under Charles IV. Mikhail Speransky in Russia, son of an illiterate village priest who becomes effectively prime minister of the Russian Empire. Just some points to consider. Now, secondly, we have Napoleon as military genius. Of course, any biography of Napoleon is going to stress Napoleon's genius. But here too, I think one has to be uh, cautious. If you look at generalship, if you'll forgive me, in general, so to speak, it has four levels. At the lowest level, you have the relationship of a general with his soldiers. You have, if you like, what I would call a personal level of generalship. And there is no doubt whatsoever that at that level, Napoleon was brilliant, unbelievably brilliant. We all know the stories. But secondly, you have the tactical level of generalship, what you do on the battlefield in the presence of an enemy. And there, we have a Napoleon who is, shall we say, distinctly variable. He has very, very good days. And as a Borodino, he has very, very bad days. And the third level is the operational. This is what happens. Uh, this is the level of, um, right, I've decided I'm going to invade Northern Italy. Which Alpine passes am I going to use to get into Northern Italy? Am I going to head for Milan or Turin when I've got to cross the Alps? It's that sort of question. And here again, Napoleon is superlative. There's no doubt about that. But lastly, at the highest level, you have the strategic. And here, I would argue that quite frankly, Napoleon was catastrophic. And you can see this over and over again. Egypt. Nobody has ever come up, ever come up with a sane explanation for what Egypt was about. Spain. 
to take over from Spain. A very, very odd decision. But OK, that could possibly have been, have been made to work. What wrecks it completely, and what wrecks the entire situation, is a decision to invade Russia. Field Marshal Montgomery, victory of Al Alamein, once said that the first, first rule of, warf of warfare is not to invade Russia. Well, yes, quite. The thing is that Napoleon not only inaugurates a two-front war, which is not a good thing, but he never had to invade Russia in the first place. Let us assume that Russia was a threat to him, and that is a very, very big assumption. Let's assume that. Let's imagine Napoleon sitting on the defensive in Poland and waiting for Alexander to come marching out of Russia. I would suggest to you that such a conflict would only have gone one way, and it would not have gone in Alexander's favour. Why then invade Russia? Moving on again, we come to the issue of Napoleon's reforms. Yeah, you, you all know what they are. Um, the abolition of feudalism across Europe, not in France, of course, it already happened there. The introduction of the civil code, the emancipation of the Jews, the introduction of the prefectural system, the introduction of a new system of secondary education in France, which is copied everywhere else. Let us deconstruct those achievements. The abolition of feudalism. It all depends what you mean by feudalism. To the extent that personal servitude existed, wherever the French armies went, yes, that, that was swept away. But in many, many places, there was no personal servitude. Feudalism was a matter of paying dues, financial dues of one sort or another. And these dues are not abolished, rather they're simply converted into rent. Does nothing to, or Napoleon does nothing in a sense to, if you like, alter the social structure. Okay, what, what next? The civil code. Well, to start off with, of course, the civil code mostly wasn't Napoleon. It was a process that was put into place um, in about 1796, I think, and was well underway by the time Napoleon comes to power. Yeah, yes, Napoleon gets involved in it. Yes, he takes great interest in it. And what does he do? He introduces two of its most unfortunate features. He is directly responsible. First of all, for the introduction of the clauses which roll back many of the rights which women had achieved or been granted in the course of the revolution. And secondly, he introduces, well, I think he, if you like, he turns the père du famille, the father of the family, into an agent of the state. To put it crudely, if I was a père du famille in Napoleonic France, if my son was to cause trouble in any way, then I would have not only the right to lock him up for 60 days on bread and water, but also the duty to do so. I would become an agent of the French police in my own home. That's in the Code of Napoleon. Moving on again, 
the emancipation of the Jews. Napoleon, we know, calls this Grand Sanhedrin in, in uh, 1807. And this supposedly emancipates the Jews. Well, no, not quite. What Napoleon was seeking to do was to make, if you want, a Catholic church of the Jewish community. A Catholic church, by, by reason of the Concordat, was firmly subordinated to the French state. French priests were, in effect, civil servants who were mouthpieces for the regime. That is what Napoleon wanted to do with every religious community in France. He tried it with the Protestant communities. And in 1807, he sets about doing that with the Jewish community. But it's more than that. Yes, French Jews were to be equal in the face of the law. Good, splendid. We can all approve of that. But they were to be barred from wearing special clothes. They were to be barred from, uh, for example, refusing to eat with Gentiles. They were to be barred from many of the cultural traditions that made them Jews. And in addition to that, Napoleon cancelled all the debts that they were owed, thereby in effect expropriating them. This is a funny sort of emancipation. Moving on again, we come to the prefectural system. Napoleon, of course, doesn't institute departments. He inherited those from the revolution, but he appoints the, the prefects. And everybody says, isn't this wonderful? The problem is that the prefectural system had many, many defects in it, even at the time. And when, of course, it was kept on after 1815 by many states, when I, when I know well is Spain, um, and it proved to be a, a very, very damaging system of government, over-centralized, apart from anything else. So, okay, we can pick up on many points there as well. What about stimulation of industry? Certainly has been claimed by, by, by some scholars that, that, that by instituting the, the continental blockade, Napoleon promoted the industrialization of Europe by keeping out British imports. Really? What Napoleon created in Europe was a captive market. It was not some sort of free trade zone. Yes, British exports were kept out, until that is Napoleon started letting them in through France, but France was protected by a massive tariff barrier. And the net result was that much of Europe was actually deindustrialized in the Napoleonic era. And even those areas that benefited, those areas actually inside the French tariff frontier, yes, they experienced some industrialization, but it was industrialization which had a very, very shaky basis. As soon as these industries were, were exposed to competition again after 1815, you see them falling back. And lastly, the empire. Yes, Napoleon establishes this great empire. One of the greatest empires that's been seen in the history of Europe. Except when you look at it, you see that it has very, well, foundations essentially of sand. It's a very, very unstable edifice. Okay, let's move on to the excuses. First of all, this is a very, very common one. He faced constant hostility from the other powers of Europe. Therefore, he was constantly at war 
and never had the, the opportunity or the chance to build on the structures of reforms which he had set up. He, he, he was never able to complete his work. What we see is an unfinished masterpiece. Sorry, it is simply not true that the Ancien Regime was permanently hostile to Napoleon. If you look at the diplomacy, you see over and over again that the powers of Europe wanted to do deals with Napoleon, tried to do deals with Napoleon, or even on occasion prepared to ally themselves with Napoleon. Only over and over again to discover that no such deal was possible. Napoleon was not a normal statesman. He did not play by the rules. We put it in terms of, of personal friendship. Friends are there for one another. Their relationship is reciprocal. It is based on mutual respect. It is based on understanding that both sides of the equation have interests. And any friendship where that understanding breaks down is not going to last for very long. And Napoleon was completely and totally devoid of that empathy. He was not possible to live with. Now, Britain discovers that first, but one by one, the, the other powers of Europe also discover it. Now, secondly, Napoleon is let down by, by his siblings. Well, yes, all right, Joseph and company weren't the most impressive people in the world. But who was it who made them king of this and king of that and king of the other? Who was it who made use of them as integral tools of his empire building? No, they weren't very good. And as, as their brother, Napoleon really should have known that. Moving on again, you have the idea that Napoleon is trapped by his situation. He says he's an upstart ruler. He has to be feared. He, so he can't compromise. He has to go on making war. He can't allow any diminution of his stature, of his, of his, of his status. Well, actually, no. I go back to the point about the Ancien Regime. The Ancien Regime was actually perfectly willing to do deals with him right to the end. Napoleon couldn't make peace for fear of what would happen in France. What would have happened in France? There would have been bonfires and fireworks all around the country if he'd made peace. France became increasingly war-weary, increasingly exhausted. And to be frank, increasingly hostile to Napoleon. And when Napoleon comes back in 1815, what do you see? Well, to start off with, Napoleon is so frightened of the French people, he won't introduce conscription, which is interesting in itself. But secondly, and, more, and, and I know you can argue that in other ways, that Napoleon didn't want to antagonize people. But in terms of what he does do, he calls back all the people, who, all the men who had been um, released from the army in 1814, calls them back up. Only about half of them turn up. There are very, very few volunteers. The National Guard won't turn up. And considerable parts of the country rise in revolt. There, there are 20,000 troops fighting in the Vendee at the time of Waterloo. And lastly, you have the idea that, well, okay, Napoleon was an imperialist, but he's one more imperialist in an age of imperialists. Well, yes, okay, fair enough. 
But nobody is arguing that, that William Pitt or Alexander I are apostles of liberty. It is Napoleon who is the apostle of liberty. So, the imperial coronation robes are starting to look rather threadbare. But then we can look at a whole range of things which Napoleon didn't do or did do, whichever way you look at it. To start off with, Napoleon did nothing whatsoever to reverse the completely um, inegalitarian nature of the revolutionary land settlement. The lands of the emigres and the church had simply been sold off to the highest bidder. The peasants hadn't got a look in. So they didn't have the money. And Napoleon does nothing to address that. On top of that, he introduces tax reforms which increase the burden um, experienced by the lower classes and makes the tax system more inegalitarian. And finally, um, he also clamps down on moves towards the formation of trade unions. You have combination laws. And French workers had to carry a passbook. Secondly, there's the, there's the issue of slavery. Napoleon, true, abolishes the slave trade in 1815. But that's a completely meaningless concession because there weren't any French slave traders at sea. French, French, the French merchant marine had been swept from the seas. And the French Navy wasn't in a position to, to do anything about actually catching slave ships. And of course, the reality was that Napoleon had restored slavery in the French Empire and gone to war against Toussaint Louverture to try to reconquer um, the de facto independent state of, of Haiti. And if anybody wants to argue that Napoleon you know, wasn't capable, wasn't, wasn't cruel personally, well, have a look at the fate of Toussaint Louverture himself. Okay, social mobility. Yes, yes, we know. Every, every drummer boy had a, had a Marshall's baton in his knapsack. No, he didn't. Social mo mo mobility was increasingly restricted in the French army. In 1792, 1793, yes, lots of ex-private soldiers, ex-NCOs had made it very quickly up the line. That very quickly comes to an end. By 1810 or thereabouts, the most that you could expect as a common soldier, and that after quite a few years service, was promotion for a captain. So you simply did not get any drummer boys making it all the way to marshals anymore. Then it has to be said that Napoleon turns France into a police state. We go back to one of his great reforms here. Yes, yes, Napoleon set up the gendarmerie, wonderful, marvelous. The trouble is that that gendarmerie's purpose was to enforce conscription. It was conscription that was at the heart of the French problem of law and order, which is very serious. The gendarmerie is effectively part of the establishment of what was a police state, and one which certainly didn't win the affections of large parts of the French people. Now to conclude, and I'm, I'm relieved to say that I'm almost exactly on time, wonderful. To conclude, none of this is to say 
that Napoleon was a wholly bad man. On a personal level, he was quite capable of being charming, of being generous. None of this is to say that the inhabitants of the Napoleonic Empire were not better off in many instances than they were, than they would have been elsewhere. Of course, it was preferable to being a peasant in Tours than to be a serf in Tomsk. Self-evident. But the problems I've outlined, I admit, I've, I've, admired, I've, I've outlined them in caricature. I admit that everything I've had to say can be opened up for discussion. It, clearly, I've only had 40 minutes. Surely, there, is, there are enough points of concern here to give any reasonable observer pause. And at the same time, to undermine any effort to offer a positive view of Napoleon on the basis of the arguments that he usually put forward. In short, Napoleon did not and does not rule okay. While in the end, all we are left with, if you will forgive the ridiculous joke, is Napoleon blown apart. Thank you all very much. The most kind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Estelle, for this wonderful, uh, although uh, provocative. I think I can I can feel some of the teeth gnashing <laughs> in the uh, in the chat. Um, we have a few questions, and I encourage um, the participants to send them to me so that we can have a discussion. Um, I think I'll start with uh, our good friend Alex Stevenson's uh, comment slash question. Charles, when will Napoleon the Terrible by Charles Esdale be coming out? Ah. <laughs> um, well, I am retired now, so I think I can I can start thinking about, about great projects. Um, no, I, in a sense, it already has come out. I've made my position entirely clear. Um, my book, um, Napoleon's Wars and International History, makes my position on the international situation quite clear. That came out in 2007 or something. And, and the very similarly titled, it, it is a completely different book, The Wars and Napoleon, um, basically explores all the issues like the civil code and feudalism and, and, and all the rest of it. In a sense, I've made my position quite clear one thing that I am interested in doing, however, um, and I'm certainly thinking about this, is a, a if you like, a revamp of um, Peter Gale's old book, Napoleon For and Against. That book is only based on the French historiography. I do think that there's room for uh, a work based on the Anglo-Saxon historiography. If that will tickle your fancy, well, um, I fear that you'll have a few years to wait yet. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. Um, uh, we have well, uh, Mova, to, to facilitate this this discussion. Um, then, why do you think the legend is so pervasive? It's it cannot be simply, you know, this people are obscuring or ignoring the problems that you outlined. Is it? Sorry, can you say that again, Alex? I couldn't hear you very well. Sure. What, what makes the legend, the Napoleonic legend, so pervasive then? Or so oh, what makes it so pervasive? The legend. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Napoleon, and, and I am the first person to admit this, Napoleon is a tremendously attractive figure. 
Um, it's also a, a very, very recognizable figure. A game I used to play with my students every year was I used to say to them, right, I want you to come up with one historical figure that you can instantly call to mind. Except there are some rules. For obvious reasons, you can't have Napoleon. You can't have any British king or queen or anybody prominent from British history like Oliver Cromwell. And you can't have anybody from the age of photography onwards. So you can't have Churchill, you can't have Hitler. Now come up with somebody. And they really struggled. And there were some very, very interesting answers, actually. Um, Alexander the Great came up quite a lot. Um, but yeah, they struggled. And I said, OK, is there anybody here who hasn't got an image of Napoleon? And I, in all the years I was teaching those courses, I, I think I only ever encountered one student who was brave enough to, start to admit that they had no idea what Napoleon looked like. They all have an image of Napoleon. And what's the most common image of Napoleon? Well, it's actually Napoleon crossing the Alps on, on, on his, his prancing steed and so forth. Um, the second most well-known image is, is Napoleon the Little Man, Napoleon on his own standing there in that, in that long gray coat, plain black hat, apparently nothing martial about his costume at all. That is, if, if Napoleon crossing the Alps is the promise of youth, the promise of adventure, the determination to take on the, 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 the challenge of nature, And it's an image which comes from the beginning of Napoleon's career. The Napoleon in his great coat is an image that comes from the end. It's the idea of the little man made good. It's the idea of the little man standing up to bullies. It's the idea of the hero on his own. So. Napoleon, so, so the legend is very, very powerful. And of course, it has to be said that if you write big books about Napoleon, you're likely to get a lot of money. And Napoleon said to his courtiers on, on St. Helena, write down everything I say, and you will make your fortune. Or I think he says, I'll make your fortune. Now, <laughs> I know that Michael Brewers is, is listening to me. Hi, Mike. Um, I, I, I suspect that various other people might be listening to me. Of course, I'm not saying that everybody who writes books on Napoleon is driven by big bucks. Of course, I am not saying that. You've, you have written a lot too. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I'm, I feel that the big bucks are absent. <laughs> but seriously, seriously, it has to be said that writing that there is a financial motive and that financial motive is very strong for certain people. Well, uh, let me ask you this. It's a, it's a question that um, several um, participants have have posed, uh, but I will choose one of them and, and ask it uh, on behalf of Jacqueline Reiter, uh, whom I think uh, you've uh, know, you know, or, uh, you know, and who participated uh, in our discussions earlier in the symposium. And the question I think goes to this heart of the matter that you presented, and that is, uh, we've heard a lot of criticism and, and she put it negative things about Napoleon tonight. So what do you think then, Professor Asdell, is the most positive thing about him or his greatest achievement?
I have great difficulty answering that question because almost anything I can come up with, let, let, let's say, you know, let's say I said the code Napoleon. Well, anything I come up with is going to be qualified by, by my concerns, by my worries and, and, and so forth. Um, I suppose that his greatest achievement um, was the creation of the Grande Armée um, in, in, the, in the period 1803, 1804, 1805. Um, he does create this extraordinarily well-balanced fighting force. Um, he does, if you like, build on all the lessons of the Revolutionary Wars. Um, so, for example, he, he strips cavalry out of infantry divisions and creates separate cavalry divisions, greatly increases the striking power of the French army. He, come, he, he does come up with the core system, that is a, a Napoleonic innovation. Um, and that was a very, all of that was, was a very, very considerable um, achievement. And of course, it's, it, it's, it's an army which he infuses with a huge amount of uh, personal loyalty, with a few, huge, huge amount of enthusiasm. Um, the French army was, was a really, really, really good instrument for socialising mostly unwilling conscripts. Um, and, I, and, I, and I can certainly take my hat off to Napoleon for that. Whether he put it to good use is another matter. Alex, Alex, you're muted. You're muted. Uh, there you go. No, I, I fixed okay. it. Okay, Charles, Alex Grab, we met many years ago in Liverpool. Yes, Alex, I know you well. Yes. Yeah, right. I, I have. I want to challenge your your approach. And this is why do we have to debate Napoleon unfavor unfavorably or favorably? I suggest not to do this. I know that it is very, very common. Not only you do it, many, many people do it. I suggest to ignore for and against Napoleon. I suggest to view the period together with the French Revolution as an extremely important, significant period in ushering modern Europe, the modern world. Good or bad for whom? Forget about good or bad. How significant are all those changes that he, that he did. How significant is are all the, the, the laws, the practice, and not just the military. Let's not focus just on the military. Education, vaccination. I spoke about vaccination earlier this afternoon. Code Napoleon, careers open to, to talent. In other words, many, many things. Now you can criticize many of those things, emancipation of the Jews, you can criticize. The point is that his period is extremely important in ushering the modern period. And it's not for or, for or against. <laughs> Objectively, it is an important period. And this is, this is why I study him. I'm not his, I don't, I don't adore him. I don't condemn him. He's not a villain. He's not a hero for me. That's, that's not the issue. You see what I'm saying? Have I actually said, Alex, have I actually said anything to contradict that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I've, 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 I've never. Absolutely, I've, you did. I've you, never you, said you, 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 you criticized. You wanted to show him is in in an unfavorable way, and I suggest not to do it. No, I think that there are two separate debates. I think one can be critical of Napoleon, and and I frankly think it is very very difficult to escape from the Napoleon for and against thing because that is how Napoleon set up the debate. Napoleon, as I, as I often used to argue to my students, is, is if you like, he's a living force. He can almost reach out from beyond the grave. He continues to shape the terms of debate. And that's why it's very, very difficult to escape from Napoleon for and against, because over and over again, you do get people coming out with the Napoleonic legend. And that can't be ignored. The issue which you bring up 
which is the the, the impact of, of the, the revolutionary Napoleonic period on the history of Europe as a whole, for good or ill, well, of course. I, I, I wouldn't deny it. What I might argue is that some of the impact of the French reforms and the prefectural system, which is very, very widely adopted across Europe, is a good example. What I might argue is that some of the, of the, the specifically French legacy was negative. I might also argue that the boost which was given positively or negatively to the rise of nationalism was extremely negative. But I would never argue that the period from 1789 to 1815 was anything other than incredibly formative in the history of, of modern Europe. Let me ask you a, a, a question so that we can keep this uh, discussion going. Uh, maybe a, a, a uh, easier question than the pondering Napoleonic legacy. Uh, the question is from uh, Ramsey Harden, and the question is this. Why did segments of Spanish population want Ferdinand so badly as a king when he descended from a French Bourbon dynasty? Wouldn't be far, would it be far to state that in essence, Joseph Bonaparte could just be seen a, as yet another French infusion into Spanish politics? Sorry, sorry, Alex, I really didn't catch what you said. So the question is, why did segments of Spanish population support Ferdinand and want him the king when he was descendant of the French Bourbon dynasty, when Joseph Bonaparte could be seen also as a French infusion into the Spanish politics? Okay, right. I mean, this, this, is, this is really, really complicated stuff, and we can easily be here um, from now until midnight British time or God knows what time American time. Um, okay. To start off with, you have to understand Spain's situation in the 20 years or so leading up to 1808, the period from 1788, uh, which is when Charles IV comes to the throne. Spain's situation was absolutely catastrophic. Um, economically catastrophic, demographically catastrophic, medically catastrophic, catastrophic in every possible sense. I mean, there was even a plague of locusts at one point in, in, in central Spain. You can't blame anybody for that. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not blaming anybody for that. All, 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 I'm, all I'm saying is, all I'm saying He could have is, done it, he would, but he couldn't. <laughs> all, all, I'm, all I'm saying is that Spain's situation was, was utterly catastrophic, and Spain's a poor country anyway, to start with. For complicated reasons to do with all sorts of infighting in the Spanish court, the young Prince Ferdinand, Ferdinand VII, is portrayed to the Spanish people as a sort of Prince Charming. He was going to be, if you like, this, this savior, this savior who was going to, to put everything to right, was going to make everything good, who was going to usher in a new golden age. And he's surrounded by this, if you like, um, blaze of propaganda. Now, you could say that <coughs> Joseph Bonaparte, French inspired reform, was a much safer bet in terms of making Spain a better place. And there are certainly many, many people on the Spanish list, in particular to this day, who argue that, the, that uh, fighting Napoleon was a uh, huge historic blunder. The fact was that Napoleon was seen as being, and even before the Peninsula War, he was seen as being a man of blood. He was associated with conscription. There were real fears 
that um, what would happen would be that huge numbers of, of Spaniards would be called up and marched off to fight in Napoleon's armies. There was real, real fear of the French. Now, however ridiculous it might be to think about Ferdinand VII as, as a Prince Charming, as, as a savior, I mean, Ferdinand VII was not the nicest individual and not the cleverest of individuals. But it's entirely understandable why um, he was seen as being preferable to anything that the French might come up with. Let me, um, since uh, to continue again the discussion, um, you, you've outlined a vision of Napoleon that is dramatically different from the one that I think Professor Brewers gave us uh, on Thursday. So, um, Maybe uh, Professor Broers would like to uh, address some of the issues. No, I don't think it's radically different. Um, I think there's a there's a difference of interpretation and nuance. Uh, I think a lot of what uh, some of it comes down to the importance of the reforms and their influence, and I think there we differ very much. I think those first five years of the reign of relative peace, um, you know, when the civil code's put together, now you said it goes back to 1796. Well, it comes and goes, it's never pulled together. You know, it, takes, it takes that relatively peaceful period of, the, con of, the, of the, the consulate to get him to sit down and chair that committee and bang their heads together. He doesn't intervene very much. Cam Bersayas runs most of that. So you know, it's not in that sense his creation, but he presides over it. As I, th I think these things are very important. Uh, I think the gendarmerie, yeah, I mean, I've studied a great deal. I mean, and obviously it's, it's a largely repressive force during the period, but you gotta look at the, there you gotta look at the legacy, not the legend, the legacy, yeah? Nobody wants the gendarmerie to go away, Charles. They want that side of its work to go. You know, they, they want that system, but without him, because that system does work. Outside France can be, a, can be a different thing, I grant you. Spain's not the template to take because these things don't take root, you know? By the 1830s, the different moderated form they're back. I think there will always differ. I look at Europe today, I see as Mark, but I, I would come back to something Alex Grab said that I've, I've agreed with um, very much that and I think it's a very sad thing that, say, Philip Dwyer, our pal, has produced his life of Napoleon. I'm trying to produce mine. And Philip said at the beginning of his, just like Alex has said, for and against isn't helpful. And yet we've become polar, you know, taken up as polar opposites of for and against. And I don't really think that works, um, you know, because I don't think it's is right. Um, I think that once you I come increasingly round to the men who overthrew him, once you take Napoleon out of running his own system, that system is still there today. So, you know, somebody finds it useful to, to say that, well, Napoleon didn't change the social structure. No, he didn't. If he tried to do that, he'd have lasted about as long as, as about as long as Abair. You know, it wasn't like that. Yeah, but you see, let me, let me ask uh, Professor Estelle to respond to this. Yeah. The, to start off with, Mike, let, let me go back to, to someone, something you, again you wrote in one of your earlier works. You basically said, that Napoleonic reform was shocking because it represented an expansion of the state, which very few people were used to. If you lived in a small German state, if you lived in a small Italian state, frankly, if you lived in the Pyrenees or the Cévennes or somewhere, um, the state didn't bother you very much. And now you have something which is absolutely 
in your face. Okay, it remains in your face. The state doesn't go away. And I agree that um, there were institutions, the gendarmerie, for example, which considerable sections of society could actually, I'm not entirely certain you'd ever exactly warm to a French gendarme, but shall, shall we say take them on board? France, for all its faults, um, was a country which was spared some of the extreme differences in wealth which you got in Spain and in Italy. In Spain and Italy, in Greece, the gendarmerie which is set up you know, remain hated right up until, until the modern era. When I was a student in Spain, you know, I, I, I knew people who would cross the road if they saw a civil guard coming. So, I don't disagree with you. Um, I, 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 in the sense that, yes, I see Napoleon engaging in a massive program of reform in France. Some things he does anew, some things he does which are continuation of policies you already seen before 1799. It doesn't really matter. The point is that Napoleon takes France in hand and he makes conscription work, for example. And there were plenty of people in France who were quite happy with that. The haute bourgeoisie, and yeah, of course, had Napoleon tried to, to do something about revolutionary land settlement, the masses of granite would have um, shifted under his feet. But the trouble is, over and over again, and uh, I was involved in a long debate on Twitter, it was just the other day with, with, a, with a young man um, who was claiming things like you know, Napoleon gave land to the peasants and things like that. Over and over again, you come up with this portrayal of, of Napoleon, who is this sort of universal benefactor. If we could strip him of that, then, then yes, we might actually arrive at a situation where you would get away from Napoleon for and against. But at the moment, that is a groove which is very, very difficult to break out of whether we like it or not. Let me, um, to switch gears and move forward, um, let me um, uh, ask a few more questions. Um, uh, Joseph Mendes uh, wants to ask you whether you have seen, uh, the question is, have you uh, seen the recent disclosure of the secret British plots to overthrow Napoleon? So I, I assume Mr. Mendes means uh, Tim uh, Clayton's recent book, yeah, that's in Secret War Against Napoleon. Yeah, there, there, I mean, there, 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 have been, there have been a number of books like that. Um, well, yes, and the point is, um, yes, of course, there, 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 there were British plots to, to overthrow Napoleon. They abandoned them fairly quickly, actually. I mean, there wasn't anything that went on after about 1804, 1805, um, basically collaborating with... Um, uh, royalist conspirators in France were seen as being hiding to nothing. Um, does it surprise me? No. Does it shock me? No, not particularly. Um, nobody is holding up William Pitt as an apostle of liberty. The problem is that people do hold up Napoleon as the apostle of liberty. And that means that they are confronted with such problems as the execution of the Duc d'Anjien, as the, you know, the sequestration of the Spanish monarchy, and so on. You know, it's 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 not for William Pitt to defend his reputation; it's for Napoleon to defend his reputation. Let me bring uh, Professor Schneid on board because he asked uh, if he could uh, make a comment and, and a question. Um, Charles, uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to see you again after all these years. Uh, wish it was in person. Um, 
But uh, I want to go back to your discussion of Napoleon and the Jews, because I think that it, it was somewhat um, inaccurate and misleading, because, of course, Sephardic Jews were given full emancipation in 1791, and the Sanhedrin was to address the unfinished question of uh, Jews, of the Ashkenazi Jews of Eastern France, uh, and integrate them into uh, French society, because there had been a perception that they had not, and an, a perception by... Uh, French administrators and, and locals that they were not fully integrated, that they were too German and not enough uh, French. But, but uh, and on the issue of debt cancellation, very, very few Jews were affected by that. The overwhelming majority of Jews were very poor. Uh, and so that, that issue certainly was not something that affected the majority of the community. But I guess in, in, in Europe contemporary, uh, both in Poland by 1806, 1807, uh, and especially even by Russia in 1812, Napoleon's perceived the Jewish communities as, as somebody who is, is a modernizer. That's the term. And there are Hasidic tales uh, from Russia at the time, which are actually fearful of the French and Napoleon as a modernizer because of that, in their impact that impact on potentially traditions, religious and cultural traditions. So, you know, in terms of Napoleon and the Jews, he's not seen as, you know, some, some nefarious uh, or problematic uh, ruler, uh, but in fact, uh, it, it benign. And, and certainly with the Sanhedrin, I think, uh, uh, and maybe Alex Grab can jump in on this as well. I mean, he wants to, he doesn't fully understand the nature of the Jewish communities and the differences between the two and integrating them. So, uh, you know, I, I understand your arguments on the other issues, but I don't think it holds for Napoleon and the Jews. Yeah, the, the whole issue, <coughs> excuse me, the whole issue of Napoleon and the Jews is you know, very difficult. Again, I was, I was squeezing a, a lot into a very short space of time. With regard to um, the position of the Jews in France, well, yes, you know, it's perfectly true that the number of Jews who were expropriated is relatively small. Uh, it's always the case that, that you know, dis despite all this thing about you know, all Jews are bankers and capitalists and all the rest, the majority of Jews have always been, at least, in the 19th, 20th, and 20th century, the early 20th century at least, the vast majority of Jews were very poor and humble people. And you know, this, this, this whole business about, about the Jews being the bankers and all the rest of it is, is nonsense. So yes, that, that's entirely true. It's also entirely true that the um, reforms of the Sanhedrin were, were about integrating the, the, the East European style Jews into the French community. And you know, Napoleon was not happy about their caftans and dreadlocks and, and all the rest of it. David Fox, I mean, sorry, do forgive me. That said, it is about control, it's not benign. Napoleon himself undoubtedly was anti Semitic. To read the memoirs of French soldiers as they march across Europe, um, particularly as they go into Russia, there's quite a lot of stuff about, about beating up Jews and so forth. But you can see a lot of anti-Semitism comes over. And, and I, I think that your last point was about how the, the leaders of the Hasidic community in, in Russia uh, saw, saw Napoleon as a modernizer. Is that what you said? Uh, I did, and they were afraid of Napoleon because he was a modernizer. Yeah, exactly. Well, that, that's, that's, that's the point I was going to draw out, that, that, you know, there were Jews who did perceive Napoleon as something other than a friend. And I, and I think that, that many of the leaders of the Jewish community who were involved in the Grand Sanhedrin um, were either very naive alternatively were engaging in which you know which has historically been you know a, a, a tactic in Jewish communities you know you go along with the authorities and you know there's there's there's, there's various ways that you can play it um so I, I I don't think there's any real clash between us actually um I don't think that 
if, if I say that Napoleon is anti-Semitic, there is not a hint of comparing him with Hitler or anything like that. You know, Napoleon is not Hitler, and I'm and I'm not going down that road. <laughs> uh, well, uh, let, let let me ask you a couple more questions because uh, we are running out of time, and I know it's getting very late in, in uh, on the other side of the ocean. So, um, uh, Alan Salazar wants to um, ask you a, a more of a broad question again um, on a balance. Then, the legacy of Napoleon is negative, or impossible to say whether Napoleon's legacy was positive to the world. You take France. Clearly, France gained many benefits from the revolution and Napoleon. You know, the, 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 the common legal system, the, the common system of administration. Um, yes, uh, equality before the law. Yes, absolutely, in, in terms of its domestic situation. The trouble is that Napoleon broke France as a great power. Um, Napoleon's, if, if you look at French international influence, if, if, if you look at France's standing, France was wrecked by Napoleon and never recovered. Thinking about things on a wider level, comes down to is this, um, believe it or not, you know, I actually do believe in democracy. I do believe in social justice. I do believe in human rights. I do believe in the civilized society in which we live. The question is, to what extent does Napoleon and indeed the French Revolution contribute to that civilized society. Um, Alex, you already know. Oh, no, I mean, this is reminiscent of the discussion we had for, with uh, Alex Stevenson on his Well, podcast. exactly, this is what I was, I was thinking of. I mean- um, Because you, you, you are not- because you're not supporting the radical revolution either, which is in many respects the, the found or lays the foundation, maybe not the firm one, but nonetheless to the, demo, to the uh, modern democratic process. Yeah. Um, you, can, you can draw all sorts of lines from the French Revolution and indeed Napoleon, and they can lead you to some pretty unpleasant places as well as pleasant places. So, so I'm hedging my bets. Let me, as a, as a follow up to this question, um, this is a question from uh, Dr. Michael Bonura. Um, and the, he asks a, a broad question about methodology. And he says, is the methodology here that because a ruler, in this case, Napoleon, because the ruler's policies and legacies were not perfect, that he should be condemned? If so, who comes out positively using that methodology? No, not, not at all. Um, the point is rather the reverse. What we have is somebody who is held up as the epitome of perfection. What we, are, what we have is somebody whose every policy is taken as being something of great benefit to humanity. What we have is somebody who is lionized at every turn. It doesn't mean to say that, that all rulers who, have, who get things wrong, all governments that get things wrong, all, all, all individuals that make mistakes should be demonized. It doesn't follow at all, not in the slightest. The trouble is that there are too many people out there who are blind to Napoleon's imperfections, who will not admit Napoleon's imperfections, and who perpetuate a myth. I think on this 
uh, note, it will be a, a good point to, to wrap up our discussion. I want to thank you, uh, Charles, for your generosity with your time, for your insightful uh, discussion. And that's, I think, what I wanted to have as a concluding event on, of this symposium is to show the, the diversity of opinion that history can elicit, to show that history is not uh, this, you know, this settled on and that we continue to have debates and discussions and that it can be done in a civil manner without uh, resorting to extremes on either side. <laughs> Um, I, I share your appeal towards uh, rational assessment of, of the past and, and to see history for all the words and, and you know, glory that it has. Thank you again for all the participants. Um, this is the end of the Masina Society's annual symposium on Napoleon. I genuinely hope that we'll have another one uh, in a year's time and that next time we'll be able to have this discussion, not simply looking at the screens, but drinking pints of beer and wine. Cheers, stay safe and well, my friends. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you.